Hello all. Uh, today we're delving into an interesting new debate in conservation biology. Given the incredible recent advancements in molecular biotechnology, some conservation biologists have recently made the argument that it would be highly beneficial for ecosystem functioning to resurrect, to bring back some of the Pleistocene megafauna. By megafauna, I mean large animals like uh, the woolly mammoth here that um, only recently, or at least relatively recently, some 10 to 12,000 years ago, uh, went extinct at the end of the last ice age the end of the Pleistocene Epoch, which lasted from about two and a half million years ago up until about 11,700 years ago. So interestingly, the woolly mammoth here actually hung on on Wrangell Island up until about 3,600 years ago. So that's a blink of an eye, right? Definitely uh, within uh, recorded human history we had uh, woolly mammoths at least roaming on Wrangell Island. So this is Dr. Jared Rathel and the title of my lecture for you today is Pleistocene Rewilding. Is this high-tech mitigation or are we just opening Pandora's box? So on April 25th and 26th in 1986, the core of a nuclear reactor in Ukraine, which was then part of the Soviet Union, exploded, releasing lethal doses of radiation uh, in the area and then raining plumes of radioactive materials across much of the Western Soviet Union and Eastern European countries. The Chernobyl disaster, is what it would come to be known, is considered the most disastrous nuclear power plant accident in history, both in terms of cost and casualties. Today, at least five million people currently live in areas still contaminated with radioactive materials. Immediately following the meltdown, 116,000 people had to be evacuated as the Soviet Union created an expansive exclusion zone to keep human beings out and away from the radioactivity. <laughs> but then the damnedest thing happened. In the absence of humans, the wildlife flourished. So this is the Przewalski's horse. It's a rare and endangered subspecies of wild horse that was introduced to the preserve, to this exclusion zone. And now it's one of the robu most robust populations of this endangered horse left on planet Earth in this radioactive exclusion zone. And it's not just wild horses. So there have been explosions of moose and deer and bison and beaver and all of those associated songbirds, right, that thrive in beaver-created habitats. There's healthy populations of carnivores like brown bear and lynx and Eurasian river otters. There's birds of prey uh, like owls and this massive white-tailed eagle. And the infamous gray wolf. So in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, wolf densities are seven times higher than in adjacent areas where people live. So if there is a silver lining to this horrendous nuclear accident, it is that nature is incredibly resilient. And that, my friends, is incredibly fortuitous. Because, as you now recognize, we have entered the age of the Anthropocene. This is an epoch where the fundamental ecological and evolutionary processes on planet Earth are now driven by us, by humans. We are wiping species out of existence at rates not seen since the end Cretaceous. The good news is that as the global population approaches 9 billion by 2050 and 11 to 13 billion by the end of the century, most of that growth is concentrated 
in our what will become mega cities, uh, cities greater than 10 million people, uh, like Tokyo here and uh, Mumbai and Los Angeles. So when we concentrate people in these cities, what it means is it leaves space across places like uh, the American West for wildlife. And we know that species, individual species, that have recently been eradicated by us and then returned by us to ecosystems can have cascading impacts across trophic levels. We just have to look to Yellowstone National Park and the reintroduction of the gray wolf in 1995. As we've discussed, uh, this apex predator influenced both the demography and the spatial ecology of Yellowstone elk, which then influenced willow and aspen uh, tree populations, regrowth, and subsequently beavers and songbirds, coyotes, foxes. So there continues to be ongoing discussions about augmenting grizzly bear populations in North Cascades National Park in Washington State. And as we will discuss in our ecology unit, grizzly bears uh, can also have a dramatic impact on calf elk uh, survival rates. So my point is that there is some precedent for the reintroduction of large mammals into areas where habitat exists and then subsequent positive ecological consequences like increases in biodiversity. In North America, the megafaunal extinction event occurred about 12,700 years ago when an estimated 90 genera of mammals weighing over 44 kilograms, those, these are mammals weighing over about 100 pounds, became extinct. And it includes some impressive animals. So uh, giant sloths, uh, short-faced bears, uh, the American lion, cheetahs, uh, the saber-toothed cats, uh, the giant armadillo, glyptodon. There was even a giant beaver. Um, so we're not talking Jurassic Park here, right? Species that went extinct 65 million years ago. We're talking about uh, animals that went extinct within a geologic blink of an eye. So if conservationists deem that the benefits of potentially bringing some of these animals back, resurrecting them, outweighs the risks, could we even bring them back? Do we have the technology? With respect at least to the woolly mammoth, the answer is, is probably. So I want you to meet Luba. Uh, she is named for the Serbian town of Ljubja, probably mispronouncing that, um, but she is a female woolly mammoth calf weighing about 110 pounds who died 41,800 years ago, probably estimated using radiocarbon dating, at the tender age of just 30 days old. You notice uh, that her ear is gone. So the story goes that there was a store owner in the small town who purchased her uh, in exchange for two snowmobiles, and he had her on display in front of his shop uh, where local feral dogs used her ear and her tail as uh, chew toys. So that's a pretty uh, precious chew toy. Hey, sorry about that. It's a quick uh, costume change and a haircut. So, Lubia, she represents the uh, best preserved woolly mammoth specimen mummy uh, found to date. So, how would we go about resurrecting the woolly mammoth? Well, there's some work that's being done uh, now at Harvard University, and they're using the new genetic tool that we've talked about, CRISPR-Cas9. So essentially, uh, the scientists start by extracting DNA from uh, lubia or other frozen woolly mammoth specimens. Then they take this woolly mammoth DNA and they splice it into the skin cells of an Asian elephant. 
So we've run the genomes on both the woolly mammoth and the Asian elephant, and these are the most closely related species. So the Asian elephant is the most closely related extant species to the woolly mammoth. Um, so the DNA uh, that's uh, being spliced into skin cells, that's going to contain the instructions uh, for those critical mammoth traits that allow it to survive in Siberia, right? So long hair and thick layers of fat and cold adapted blood. Scientists then uh, genetically reprogram these stem cells, I'm sorry, these skin cells uh, to act like stem cells. So again, a stem cell, an embryonic stem cell, has uh, the potential to become any sort of tissue, right? It's pluripotent. Next, scientists take the DNA out of uh, one of these uh, cells. It was initially an, a skin cell that's been reprogrammed to act like a stem cell. And then they insert that DNA into the egg of an Asian elephant that it's had, that's had its nucleus removed. The eggs are then stimulated to start multiplying, and the egg, of course, turns into an embryo. So the embryo could either be grown to term potentially in an artificial womb, or it could be planted into the uterus of uh, an Asian elephant. So an Asian elephant would give birth to a uh, woolly mammoth, or at least a woolly mammoth hybrid. So um, this is where the technology is at. Um, there's other potential de-extinction candidates too, besides the woolly mammoth, some that went uh, extinct even more recently. So in 2017, researchers finished sequencing the entire genome uh, for the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. These wolf-like carnivorous marsupials carried their young in pouches just like kangaroos, but they also sported uh, tiger-like stripes on their backs and supposedly had jaws uh, capable of opening up uh, to this really impressive 120 degree uh, gape. So these thylacines, these Tasmanian tigers, they were once common across much of Australia and uh, New, um, New Zealand, uh, not New Zealand, New Guinea. The thylacine vanished from the Australian mainland about 3,000 years ago. However, it survived on uh, Tasmania, uh, island uh, to the south of Australia, only to be hunted into extinction by Europeans uh, in the 1800s. So this is an actual photograph of a thylacine. Um, the last known thylacine died in the Hobart Zoo in 1936. So the thylacine is one, just one potential de-extinction candidate. Uh, another really good species uh, potentially for ecosystems to bring back would be the passenger pigeon. So unfortunately, probably not many of you know the story of the passenger pigeon, but it was actually the, uh, recently, it was the most numerous bird in terms of abundance in North America. It was probably the most numerous bird in North America for tens of thousands of years prior to its extinction in 1914. So these passenger pigeons, they lived in mega flocks comprising several billion individuals moving nomadically across the landscape and consuming the fruit and the mast, uh, the seeds of trees like beech and oak and chestnut. The, the size and the density of these passenger pigeon flocks as well as their migratory patterns probably shaped the uh, distribution of tree species in eastern North American forests for tens of thousands of years. So these forests really relied upon these birds to distribute their seeds and now uh, in their absence biodiversity has been declining across um, eastern deciduous forests. So the question that your generation uh, will grapple with is could uh, the process of de-extinction using these new molecular tools, could it mitigate some of the harm of our past folly? 
meaning um, you know the short-sightedness of uh, hunting the passenger pigeon into extinction for feathers for hats and eating the young or um, killing off the thylacine um, could uh, de-extinction mitigate uh, some of the damage that we have wrought or uh, by bringing back these species that have already gone extinct are we opening the proverbial Pandora's box so of course Pandora's box is this myth um, about when we make a miscalculation that has all kinds of unforeseen complications <laughs> and when we start uh, tinkering with ecosystems, uh, at least historically, there have definitely been unforeseen complications. So Hawaiian sugarcane farmers purposefully introduced uh, this little carnivore, the mongoose, to their fields in 1883. The goal was to control rat populations that were eating the sugarcane turned out to be a huge mistake with lasting ecological consequences that still reverberate today. So uh, what the sugarcane farmers didn't recognize is that rats are nocturnal, whereas the mongooses are diurnal, primarily active during the day, right? So these exotic predators that they introduced to the Hawaiian Islands never came in contact with their rodent prey. Um, and sadly, native bird populations began crashing instead as the mongoose began preying on um, these naive native birds and their eggs. Um, today, mongoose uh, continue to gobble their way through native nestlings and turtle eggs, and uh, conservation biologists uh, have put up mongoose-proof fencing um, but the eradication programs uh, are very costly and difficult to maintain. We know that after a species has been introduced um, and established, it can have uh, major ecological, negative ecological consequences and can be very hard to eradicate. So this is the non-native Burmese python, um, likely introduced by irresponsible pet owners to the Florida Everglades. It has established a breeding population in South Florida, and um, it's one of the most concerning invasive species uh, in the country right now. It's in Everglades National Park. Since pythons have become established, there have been severe mammal declines in Everglades uh, linked to uh, these snakes. So the most severe declines have occurred in the remote southernmost regions of Everglades National Park, where pythons have been established the longest. In a 2012 study, it was a shocking study, populations of raccoons had dropped by 99.3%, possums by 98.9%, and bobcats by 87.5%. So uh, these mammals that have been declining so quickly and so rapidly uh, are often found in the stomachs of Burmese pythons removed from Everglades National Park. So as I have expressed to you many times this semester, um, I don't pretend to have the answer here. I honestly don't know what the right course of action is. Um, obviously, the thought of Pleistocene rewilding is certainly intriguing uh, to a biologist like myself. Um, but uh, one thing that I do agree with at this point, uh, as I usually do, is uh, this um, idea put forth by uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, he said, the cloning, it may be good and it may be bad, but probably it's a bit of both. Um, the question of cloning, of using these molecular techniques, um, it should not, must not be greeted with reflex hysteria, but decided quietly and soberly and on its own merits. So as Dawkins often advocates, we need less emotion and more thought. Um, so hopefully uh, this lecture has given you something to think about uh, moving forward uh, as conservation biologists, wherever your path may take you. Thanks for your time. Cheers.